I have a book coming out called The Infinite Resource, The Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. Uh, and this talk is basically a, a short version um, of that book. A long time ago, Dickens wrote these words in the opening of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And this pretty much captures the, the current, current discussion of what's happening on this planet. In a lot of ways, we're living in the greatest age humanity has ever seen. And you'll hear a lot about that here at Singularity University. But in a lot of ways, we're facing some of the worst risks also. So you see sort of highest levels of optimism in some parts of society and highest levels of pessimism in other parts. Now, at the opening of, of the GSP, I think you all got the challenge of finding a way to make the world better for a billion people. And there is no topic uh, bigger than the ones I'm about to talk about, which is literally the fate of the planet and of human civilization, and the core question of can we keep growing richer and better off without over-consuming and destroying the world that we live on, okay? So is the future one of sort of utopias that are uh, incredibly prosperous but also green, or is it a future like this? Who can name this film? Planet of the Apes, very good. This is an easy one. They will get harder. All right, so let's start with the best of times. I was born in 1973 in Egypt, in a working class neighborhood like this. Okay? And when I was born, um, infant mortality in Egypt was 15%. So I had a one in six chance of dying before um, age five. And so that's always given me a tremendous perspective. When I look back at, at where I came from and what life is like in America versus what life is like in my parents' generation, um, it's amazing that America is obviously such a better place. But it's not just a difference between cultures, it's a difference in time. Because there was a time, well, I should say in my parents' generation it was even worse, um, three of my father's died in infancy, and five of my mother's siblings died in birth, right? But again, this is not just an issue of culture, because in the United States, in 1900, infant mortality was 25%, and in big cities, it was one in three. In Chicago in 1900, one out of three children born died before their fifth birthday. So the change is striking. Uh, today in Egypt, it's 2%, and in the U.S., it's 0.7%. Almost no metric uh, summarizes the progress we've made better than that. You can pivot it another way and look at life expectancy, and you see that over the last half century, it's soared. The top line of the developed world, where life expectancy has gone up by about 13, 14 years, and the red line is the world as a whole, where life expectancy has gone up even more, and now it's at about 66, 67 years around the planet, where it was about 30 years of life was the average in 1900. Poverty has dropped. The fraction of the world living on less than one dollar a day in the 1970s was around one-third of the world. And today it's down to just around five percent. So we've made huge strides, not just in the rich world, but in the world overall. Education, one of the most fundamental enablers of people to make a better life for themselves, has soared. So the top line is the United States, but here you see India and Ethiopia, the yellow and red lines, as two sample countries from the rest of the world catching up. This is on a log scale, but you see the ratio of how much schooling the average person uh, growing up in the US gets versus how much schooling the average person growing up in Asia or Africa gets is shrinking over time. And that's a tremendous fundamental enabler of people. Connectivity is at an all-time high, something that you've probably heard Peter talk about. So mobile phones went from a technology that did not exist, practically speaking, in the 1990s to one that today reached more than three quarters of the world. So more than four billion people have access to a mobile phone. And if you count people who uh, have a friend with a mobile phone, that number is even higher. And the internet uh, is close behind that. So again, it's gone from a technology that almost didn't exist for all effects and purposes in 1995 to one that has two billion users today and is rapidly growing. So we're living in an age of sort of the greatest, the least poverty, the least hunger, and the most interconnectivity of all time. That's had other consequences. As people have grown richer and as their ability to communicate has gone up, 
they've demanded more control of their lives and more participation in the political process. So today, the fraction of the world that lives in a democracy is also at an all-time high. And there's a clear connection there. There's a lot of theoretical work linking levels of education in a country to levels of democracy in a country. And there are many theorists who would tell you that once a nation passes a certain level of average education, democracy is fairly inevitable. And we perhaps are seeing some of that with the Arab Spring now. Perhaps more surprisingly to uh, American audiences, at least, is that the world is becoming more equal. So this is a distribution of income in 1970. So it's a scale across the bottom from left to right is poor to rich. And from top to bottom is how many people live at that income level. So you see in 1970, the world had a lump sort of off towards the left and then a long tail of people getting richer off to the right. And in 2006, the last year for which we have great numbers, the income distribution has both shifted to the right, people have gotten richer, but it's also become more equal. It looks more like, let's see that again. So in 1970, you have kind of a big lump of people living on between one and two dollars a day. Those are the two vertical black lines. And in 2006, we've taken the people on the far left in poverty, and they've moved up in income tremendously faster than the people on the right. The world, on a macro scale, is getting more equal in income. OK, so best of richest, most democratic, but best off, et cetera, but also potentially the worst of times. So let me tell you a story. On Christmas Day, 2005, I woke up before dawn in Guatemala. I got up and I hiked through the jungle to get to uh, this structure. This is Temple 4 in the Mayan city of Tikal. And in 900 AD, this was the tallest structure in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, it was the tallest structure in the Western Hemisphere until about 1900. Um, it was a skyscraper. And it was the middle of a giant city inside of a civilization of about 20 million people. That morning, when you looked out as the dawn came up, it was a, an amazing sight, everyone. It's a jungle, there's howler monkeys, uh, there's giant roars. You feel like you're on the set of a Jurassic Park. And the structure just underneath the sun in this picture is about one mile away from where I'm standing. But this was not jungle a thousand years ago. This was the heart of a metropolis. But when uh, West found this for the first time in the early 20th century, all of that had been reduced to this. If you walk through a Mayan city right now, what you find is not uh, so many great tall buildings. You find a lot of mounds. They look like hills, but they're not hills. This is the ruins of a thousand years. These cities were literally abandoned for a thousand years. The Mayan population dropped by a factor of 10 from its peak to what it was when uh, Spaniards came. So what happened to the Maya? Well, the Maya were at the, the peak of their success. They're the peak of their population. And to feed that population, they had to chop down all the trees around them to turn that land into farmland. In so doing, the soil to erode. They removed the ability of trees to capture water and turn it into rainfall, which exacerbated drought. They were hit by some climate change of a global variety as well that also brought drought. And what that meant is that they exhausted their fundamental energy source, which was food. Food is the first energy te technology. Without food, you can't run your civilization. And the Maya ran out of that. And that led to more conflict in their society and eventually to an utter collapse. Okay? Could that happen to us? Well, the number one energy source for humanity is fossil fuel. And none is more important than oil. In the 1950s, a fellow named M. King Hubbard predicted that uh, we would see an oil production in the US eventually peak and then drop. He did this in a very simple way. He looked at data from any given oil well. You can see that of, it starts off with a high flow, it goes up and up and up, and then eventually the field underneath it is depleted, and it goes down and down and down. So his methodology was simply, I'm going to sum up those curves of production for an entire country and see what happens. And he predicted that the US would peak in oil production around 1970. No one believed him, essentially, that here's what happened. Um, oil production initially rose and rose and rose after his... But then in 1970, it actually did hit 
a peak that he predicted, and then it went down and down and down. And it is somewhat resurgent. In the last two years, we have seen in overall oil production in the U.S., but that still has the U.S. producing half the amount of oil that it did in 1970. Okay? Well, the U.S. is just one place, it's just one country. It's not the world's biggest oil producer. Oil is a global commodity. Well, Hubbard also predicted that on a global scale, we would see oil production peak around the year 2000, using the same methodology. And for a long time, people thought he was crazy, and production went up and up and up. Then it kind of plateaued, went up more slowly. And then for the last eight years, since 2004, it's been effectively plateaued. So oil production has changed by about 4% over the last eight years, which is what used to happen every two to three months. That's how fast oil production was gaining in the 1950s. So let's look at that more closely. So since 2004, the red line is the price of oil and the black line is the production of oil. So I'm a capitalist, I worked at Microsoft, I can't deny it. The thing I know about corporations is they exist to make money. In the presence of a very high price for one's commodity, one has every incentive there is to produce more of that commodity. And so far, uh, oil producers have not been able to keep pace with demand, and that's why prices um, are so high. They do fluctuate. You see in 2008, the price came down. That's because of a recession, right? And there's actually some data suggesting that the, the peak in the price of oil was one of the major contributors to the global recession and not just financial shenanigans. Now, there is plenty of oil in the ground. The problem is not how much oil is in the ground, it's our ability to pump it out. Um, we have gotten better and better at pumping oil out of wells. It used to be that an oil field had a maximum recovery of about 30%. You could get one third of the oil out of the field, and after that it was under too little pressure to get the rest. So we've gotten better and better at increasing that amount by pumping in high-pressure water, pumping in steam, pumping in detergents. But fundamentally, you can't take a field past 100% recovery. And the problem is that all of our uh, holding on to current uh, production level has been by forcing more and more oil out of these fields. They're getting more and more exhausted. And the rate of discovery of new fields has not kept pace with the rate of production. The black line is production, and the bars below it is the rate of discovery. So the whole way that we're keeping up with demand is just by kind of squeezing these existing fields for more and more of the oil that's in them. And this poses some severe risks for us to come. People talk about peak oil. We might basically be in peak oil right now. We might not. There are a lot of, ac a lot of uh, economic incentives to try to pump oil production up further, but again, we've been more or less at a plateau since 2004, 2005. So oil is not the only resource that is potentially scarce. Water is life. We use 70% of the world's water uh, for agriculture. People talk about uh, conserving water off the tap, taking shorter showers, that is not the major source of water. It, water is predominantly a resource used to grow food. Okay. Uh, can anyone name this body of water? Very good. Almost no one ever gets this. Oh, okay, back there. All right, Federico. Very good. Yes, that's right. The RLC uh, is a freshwater body. Um, it was the fourth largest water body on the Earth. Um, at the time of this photo, 1989, from NASA. Um, here's what it looked like in 2003, and uh, here's what it looks like today. What, what is this lake called? The RLC, A-R-A-L-C. The RLC is between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And what happened to it is that the USSR in its dying days, and then later Russia, basically diverted all the rivers that fed into it and pumped all the water out of it to grow food and other agricultural commodities like cotton. And so now, this sea that took tens of thousands of years to fill up is gone, effectively. The area around it is dotted with the bones of fishing villages. There's whole villages with boats dried up on sandy bed, uh, and no economy, uh, no fish, and no water to keep growing those crops. You see that in Google Maps. Yep, thank you. So go pull it up and zoom in. Now, 
The ROC, as I said, is between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, for the fraction of people here who don't live near that, it might seem very academic, but this is not just a phenomenon of one place. It's a phenomenon worldwide. And right here in the United States, we have um, this thing, the Ogal Aquifer. This aquifer is an underground reservoir of water that is filled with the melt of glaciers that retreated 13,000 years ago. It has a, a refill time of between 10,000 and 20,000 years, is how long it will take to refill this. And since 1960, we have pumped nearly half of the water out of it. On current pace, this will be entirely drained by 2050. And in fact, in some areas, like northern Texas, the wells that go into this aquifer are running dry right now. And so people, farmers who are pumping this water out to grow crops, grow cotton, um, are no longer able to do so. And if we run out of water, uh, agriculture fails. So this is a, an actually a global civilization risk. All right, there's a saying that there's plenty of fish in the sea. Uh, that was once more true than it is today. We have overfished the deep oceans previously and uh, more than half of all fish species that humans consume are fully crashed or tremendously overconsumed, and there are basically no fish species left that we know of that are underexploited in the deep ocean, if you will. In fact, you'll see phenomena like uh, about a decade ago, 15 years ago, we discovered this species called orange ruffy. We had known the species, but it became um, suddenly commercially viable. And those went from being not humans at all to being nearly crashed in a span of less than 20 years. Okay. Forests. Uh, the economists call the world's forests the world's lungs. Uh, they're responsible for about 20% of the oxygen that we breathe. They're also incredibly important in the moisture cycle. Forests capture a tremendous amount of moisture passing, turn that into cloud, and turn that into rainfall. So we depend on it. Um, in antiquity, about two thirds of the land area of the planet was covered in forest. Today, it's about one third. And primarily, that difference, that one third of the world's land area, or half of the original forests that are gone, is because of agriculture. Agriculture is the number one cause of deforestation. Pretty much we chop down forest or we slash and burn it into farmland or turn it into grazing land for cattle. And while we've made good strides in rich countries, so North America and Europe have reversed the trend of deforestation and are holding steady or even slightly increasing, in the tropics, the trend is continuing. And we're still chopping down forest in Brazil and in Indonesia and other areas where we really would like not to be. And perhaps the largest global risk is uh, climate change, global warming. So I'm going to show you what the temperature looks like since 1880. Okay? This is the temperature record compiled from nearly 100,000 separate sensors and more than a billion data points from 1880 to today. And what you can see is that temperature in degrees Fahrenheit has risen by about 2 degrees in that time. You also see it's not a smooth transition. There's no guarantee that any year is warmer than the one before it. It's a jagged line that jumps up and down over time. But if we look at kind of the overall trajectory, we'll see that the shorter the time period, the closer you get to the present, the faster the change is happening. So that change is accelerating. Um, and it's because of the CO2 we're pumping into the atmosphere. Records, ice cores drilled from Antarctica and Greenland that go back 800,000 years, and recently longer than that, show a close coupling of CO2 levels in the atmosphere and temperature for the last 100,000 years. And now, if you look at that blue line, we're at CO2 levels that we haven't seen in any of these ice cores. If we go back further and look at sediments from the bottoms of lakes, we find that we're at CO2 levels that haven't been seen in the lifetime of our species. We haven't seen these levels in a million years. And in fact, the last time CO2 levels were this high, there were no ice caps um, and seas were dramatically higher. Now that's still a slow process. It takes a long time to melt the ice caps, but it's a process that's starting right now. Now, not everyone, not everyone is a numbers person. Some people like more kind of visual or, or visceral evidence. So let me show you a couple other examples of what's happening. This is the Bear Glacier in Alaska. 
Uh, this is a picture of it in 1920, and here's a picture of it now, 2005. Okay. This is the Peterson Glacier, also in Alaska. Here's a picture of it in 1920, and here's that same area right now. It's almost unrecognizable. Watch the mountains, watch the profile of peaks there. It's the same place, but you wouldn't know it any other way. Okay, that's one sign of what's happening. And that ice will eventually turn into higher sea levels. Now, that will take a while. Sea levels will rise between one and two meters this century, so three and six feet. That's actually not the biggest threat that we have. The biggest threat we have isn't a threat towards the end of the century. It's a threat that's starting right now. And it's a threat to our production of food more than anything else. And that's caused by more extreme weather, more heat, more drought, and more fire. Okay? In 2003, Europe suffered its worst heat wave since 1940. Its worst heat wave in nearly 500 years. 70,000 people died. Ukraine lost three quarters of its grain harvest. About a quarter of the forests in Portugal burned. In 2009, China was hit with its worst uh, drought in more than a century, a one in a hundred years level drought event. In 2010, it was hit by another one in a hundred years frequency drought level event, which doesn't quite add up. Wells that had provided water since the 16th century stopped. Now, this happens because warmer air can trap more moisture. More moisture up from the ground, and then it can deposit it in other places. So while we see drought increasing around the world, we also see incidents of flooding increasing, because the moisture we do get ends up more concentrated. So in 2010, after that air picked up all that moisture away from China, it deposited it in Pakistan. And an area twice the size of the state of Texas, an area larger than Germany, was underwater in Pakistan. There are no recorded floods in history as bad as this in that region. Then later in Russia, we got another massive drought and another massive heat wave. In 2010, 55,000 people died of heat in Moscow alone in the months of July and August. And then last summer, um, in the U.S., we had one of the hottest summers on record. In the American South, in Texas, we had the driest 10-month period ever on record, and we had 4 million acres of forest in Texas alone burn. Normally, in a normal year, 1 to 2 million acres burns across the entire U.S. in a summer of fires. This is a dramatic kind of off the scales. And now we're looking at uh, this summer, uh, the hottest May uh, on record on the planet, it was May. We don't have the final numbers in for June yet. And now we have a massive heat wave going on on uh, most of the United States, fortunately not the West Coast. So there are severe challenges that are happening right now. And I mentioned this is a threat to agriculture. When these fires hit Texas, Texas's wheat crop dropped by about half. Texas's hay crop was basically destroyed. So when you have extreme weather, it poses a real threat to, again, that most fundamental energy source of humanity. Now, even if the temperature wasn't a problem, there are other problems with the CO2 production, which is that CO2 hits water and gets turned into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Uh, you've had a little bit of it any time you've had a carbonated beverage. Your body produces it when you exhale. When you produce CO2 in your body, it gets turned into carbonic acid before you uh, exhale it through your lungs. A little carbonic acid is not the worst thing, but a lot of carbonic acid is. It affects the ability of anything that builds shells. So calcifiers, coral reefs, for instance, which do fine at low levels of carbonic acid, uh, get do progressively worse and worse. And current projections are that about half of the coral species on Earth will not survive the degree of acidification of the oceans that we have coming up. So all of this assumes sort of linear warming, but there are other exponential processes at work. Um, in particular, there's a huge amount of buried carbon frozen in tundra and the seafloor that poses a huge risk of explosive release. So this is a tundra in Alaska. Actually, it was tundra. Now it's melting. Now this is what you call a thaw lake, which is that it was once completely frozen, now it's not. And as this lake thaws, frozen vegetable matter that was there starts to decompose and give off methane. 
and methane is a tremendously powerful greenhouse gas. You can see it here. This is a methane bubble that is formed underneath the ice. It's about half a meter wide. How do we know it's methane? Well, methane is natural gas. If you poke a hole in this bubble and light it, it will burn. And when it gets into the atmosphere, methane has, in its first few years, about 100 times the warming power of carbon dioxide per uh, molecule of carbon, and over the long term, about 30 years. And there is a huge amount of buried carbon in the world. The world's forests and soil and tundra have about uh, three times as much carbon in them as the atmosphere does right now. The world's oceans have another very large reservoir. So if any of this did explosively into the atmosphere, we're looking at the ability to take the uh, warming effects that we currently think will reach us around 2100 and accelerate them so they reach us around 2020 instead. So that's not something that we want. And there is this risk of kind of these positive feedback loops of high temperature, thaws the permafrost, which produces more of that, which leads to more temperature, which leads to more permafrost thaw. This is not just a theoretical possibility, it's happened. So 13,000 years ago, when the last ice age ended, we ended the period called the Younger Dryas and soared by about 10 degrees in the span of a couple decades. Okay? So this has happened on planet Earth before. We know that climate can change extremely, extremely rapidly. And today we see that the largest reservoir of methane on the planet, which is the undersea sediment, frozen methane slush in the bottom of the Arctic is starting to go. A Russian expedition uh, in December and January, just recently, found kilometer-wide plumes of methane bubbles rising up from the sea as the methane hydrate at the bottom, that's kind of a frozen slush, has started to melt. So if we sum all of this up, all the ways that we're sort of overusing, overpolluting the planet, people like to talk about what is our overall footprint on the world. And a group called the Footprint Network has tried to calculate this. What they've found is that currently, we're not using just one planet Earth's worth of resources. We're using about one and a half planet Earth's worth of resources. And that if everyone in the world lived the same lifestyle as an American, we'd be using about five planet Earth's worth of natural resources. I don't have four spare planet Earths. Any of you? I didn't think so, but if you do, come on, let, let's chat. So the problem, uh, many would say, is growth. Who can name this city? Hong Shanghai. Hong Kong was a good guess, but it's Shanghai. So Shanghai was little more than a fishing village on the river 20 years ago, and now it is a mega metropolis. And that has come with tremendous growth, tremendous opportunity and benefit for the people of China and the people of this region, but it's also meant the use of more steel, more carbon, more water, all of the things that end up producing externalities. So an increasing number of people say that we have to stop this, that this sort of economic growth comes with uh, negative consequences, and so the growth itself has to be paused. Bill McKibben, who's a, a wonderful environmentalist, wrote in his book, Earth, that growth is a problem. A fellow named Paul Gilding, another prominent environmentalist, wrote um, that we have to end shopping and the, the consumer uh, economy basically has to end if we're going to save the planet. A fellow named uh, Richard Heinberg at the Post Carbon Institute wrote a book called Peak Everything. The subtitle is Waking Up to the Century of Declines. That it's not just oil that's going to peak, but as a result of that, and for similar reasons, all minerals, wood, water, etc. And we just have to get ready for a world where we just can't use as much, we have to use less. This, unfortunately, runs into some basic issues, which is that the world is getting richer and it's still growing in population, and so demand is rising. Over the next 40 years, we expect the demand for water to go up by half, food to go up by 70%, and the demand for energy to double. So we can't just uh, say, oh, we're gonna use less, and ignore the fact that people want more, people are trying to use more. And most of that demand increase is not going to come from the West. Demand is not really rising in the United States or Europe or Japan. It's rising in China and India and Africa. That is where most of the demand is coming from, and it's going to continue to for some time. And while demand is rising there, and that's where the growth is coming from, these are the places that are rising out of poverty. So there is no 
way that you could say, oh, the West got rich using these resources, but I'm sorry, rest of the world, I'm sorry, bottom four billion, bottom five billion people, you can't do the same. That wouldn't be just, even if it were practical, even if there were a way to do it. Now, the good news is that we have faced situations like this before. We've been warned of problems like this before. Years ago, Thomas Malthus wrote that uh, we were doomed, essentially, because population increase was exponential. So demand and consumption was exponential, but the production of the most important resource, food, was only linear. So in his view, the red line that was consumption would always outpace, outpace the green line that was production. He thought that England, his home country, would face, face massive die-offs in the early 1800s, and he was wrong. Um, in 1968, Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb, widely quoted today, highly respected, and he opened that book with the sentence, the war to feed humanity is over, billions will die, at this late date, nothing can prevent a rise in the overall world death rate. And he was wrong. He thought we would see massive famines in the 1970s and an increase in global deaths. And in fact, the death rate has plummeted and the death rate has plummeted. And the best-selling environmental book of all time, The Limits to Growth in 1972, also had massive problems. And these guys, they, they speak to a geek's heart because what they did was they created a computer model, they plugged in different variables, and they ran their model, and their model said that we were doomed. What it said was that economic growth, more wealth, all meant more pollution and more consumption of non-renewable resources. And that eventually would take the world beyond the limits of what it could provide and into collapse. But the collapse predicted is not manifesting yet either. So what happened here? Well, a couple things happened. One is that population has not behaved the way that we feared that it would. As the world gets richer, and especially as women get more economic power, more education, more job opportunities, and more freedom, what we see is that fertility. In the 1950s, the average woman had five children over the course of her lifetime. Today, it's about 2.3, 2.4. And when that crosses 2.1, 2.0, population stops growing, okay? And this is a phenomenon primarily of and education. Wealth and education are the best contraceptives we know of. So we want them to rise worldwide if we want to stabilize population. The other thing that all of these speculators missed is the power of ideas the power of innovation to multiply the value of any resource that exists and to reduce the amount of a resource that you have to use to get the same benefit. So let me give you just one example. Ehrlich thought in the population bomb that food production could not possibly keep up with population. Thomas Malthus thought the same. But if we look at the number of calories available per person on Earth, per person, even though population has more than doubled since the 1960s, of calories available per person has risen by about a third since then. So we've tripled food production since the 1960s, and we've done it by, by breeding new strains of wheat and rice and corn, by producing new ways to create fertilizer, and so on. In fact, if we look over a very long period of time and we look at how many people can one acre of land feed, we'll find that in antiquity, it was less than a thousandth of a person. And today, that you can feed per acre with the best farming practices. So let's look at that another way. We talk about the, the footprint. How much land, how much earth does humanity use overall? This is the amount of land that it took to feed one person in prehistory, when we were hunter-gatherers, around 3,000 acres. And what's happened over 10,000 years is that through innovation, through technology, we've shrunk that to the point that now it's about a third of an acre to feed one person. So we've increased the productivity of the land by a factor of 10,000. In turn, has spared a lot of wild forest. If we try to feed the population we have today using the farming techniques of the 1960s, we would have had to chop down essentially all of the remaining forest on the planet. That dotted line is how much land we would have to be using to farm right now, and the black line on the bottom is how much land we actually use. And that delta is about the amount of all forest left on the planet. So we only have the forests that we have left on this world because we've gotten better at producing food on 
on the land that we have. So ideas can reduce resource use. Let me show you more examples of that. We haven't just reduced the amount of land it takes to grow food, we've reduced the amount of energy it takes to grow food. People criticize the green revolution, the increase in farming yields in uh, most of the world, because they are more industrialized. They use oil, they use uh, natural gas, we use fertilizer. But if we actually look at how much energy goes into producing one calorie of land, or one calorie of food, it's dropped by about half since the 1970s because we've gotten more efficient at everything that we do. Here's one example of that. We use a tremendous amount of nitrogen fertilizer to grow food, but the energy it takes to produce nitrogen fertilizer has dropped by about a factor of 10 since 1900, because we've just gotten more efficient at these processes. The number of calories you can produce per liter of water has basically doubled. This is data with Australia. Uh, this is data with wheat, also in Australia. As again, we've gotten better breeds, we've gotten more efficient irrigation techniques. Air travel. We know that air travel uses a lot of energy, right? Well, the amount of fuel used per passenger mile in the jets sold today is one-third the amount of fuel used per passenger mile of the jets sold in the 1960s. LEDs are 500 times as efficient at turning energy into light as candles. Steel production in the U.S. uses one-fifth the energy per ton of steel produced that it did in the 1960s, and one two-hundredth the amount of energy per ton of steel used, uh, created as it did in the 1800s. What that adds up to on a macro scale is that in some ways, consumption is reaching a tipping point and turning around. So in the 1970s, the average American used uh, more than 30 barrels of oil, and today, we're down to less than 20 barrels of oil per person per year in the United States, and it's projected to keep on dropping. In fact, I think it will drop faster than this right here. Water, which we depend on, the amount of water the average person in the US uses has also dropped by about a third since the 1970s. It's dropped really because agriculture has gotten more efficient. So ideas can reduce resource use if harnessed properly. Ideas can also find substitutes for scarce resources. Let me tell you a couple of stories about that. This is a sperm whale in the Pacific. Uh, we killed off the sperm whales. In the mid-1800s, a fleet of nearly 1,000 fishing vessels in North America hunted sperm whales and killed off about a quarter million of them, a third of the species, in a span of about 20 to 30 years. We did that not because we really valued whale meat, but because we valued the oil. Sperm whale oil was the premier source of lighting of that era. It produced a clear light without odor, without smoke, and so it was highly in demand. There was no source you could get that was better than that. And that demand meant prices were high, which gave incentive to those, to those whalers to go out there and, and kill sperm whale. And we faced a problem that was sort of like peak oil. We actually faced a, a peak whale oil crisis, if you will. Over time, those whaling boats had to go farther and farther and farther to find sperm whales to kill, and there were fewer of them in the ocean, and the ones that survived were more and more shy of dealing with humans. In fact, Moby Dick was based on a real event where a sperm whale that had been attacked several times uh, spotted a ship called the Essex, attacking a pod of females, and that sperm whale dove, came up and rammed that ship and sank it, because it had learned over time that humans were its enemies. So from an economic standpoint, the price was going up and the supply was going down, not dissimilar to what we have today. That was solved not by the discovery of more sperm whales, but by innovation. So this fellow is Abraham Gessner. He's a Canadian physician and geologist, and he knew that there was a huge market for a placement for whale oil. If he could find a product that worked as well, he could make millions. And so he eventually produced something called kerosene. He found that if he heated up coal, captured the vapors, and condensed them, he had something that burned better than whale oil, and that he could sell at about a tenth of the price. He was not, so far as we know, an environmentalist. There's no evidence in his journals that he cared about sperm whales at all. He did care about making money, and he cared about scientific curiosity, and that led him to produce something that was ultimately a much larger supply and uh, much more beneficial to the environment, at least as we understood it then. So that's one. <clears throat> Here's another. This is one of the Chincha Islands off the coast of Peru. 
And for a while, this was the most valuable real estate on planet Earth. Why? Well, because of the birds. Well, actually, not exactly the birds, but because of the bird droppings. So for millions of years, birds nesting on these islands had been depositing guano, bird shit, uh, on these islands, and guano is loaded with nitrogen. And so it makes it an incredible fertilizer. And in fact, some people, some organic farmers use it even today. It was um, sold as a fertilizer and bags you could buy to put on your fields, and agriculture in the U.S. and Europe depended on it. Basically, this product doubled the yield of crop you could get per acre in the U.S. and Europe. It was so vital that President Fillmore, in his 1850 State of the Union address, mentioned the Chincha Islands as a strategic U.S. interest, the same way that a president now might talk about the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. Right? So valuable that Spain, Peru had been a, a Spanish uh, colony, uh, sent its most powerful uh, warship, the Numencia, a brand new clad, at the head of a fleet to reconquer these islands because they wanted the revenue. A war was fought, uh, Peru and Costa Rica and Chile against Spain. Eventually the Spaniards lost. But then something else happened, which was this was a finite resource. So even after a war was fought for this, the islands dried up. Eventually the guano was mostly gone. Uh, so people had to scramble to find a new source. So they found it uh, north of there in the deserts, the Tarapaca Desert, northern Peru. And now this became the most valuable source of uh, saltpeter, which was the nitrogen fertilizer we extracted from there. So valuable that Chile, that had come to Peru's aid, invaded Peru to take this away from them. And then Chile became the world's Saudi Arabia, that had a near monopoly on fertilizer, and all the world depended op upon it to be able to grow their food. But then after about 20 years of that, people began to notice that the yields, or the, the amount of saltpeter they could mine, was dropping the incoming president of the British Royal Society in 1900, in his address, said, the world is doomed. He actually said, man is doomed, because this stuff was so valuable in the US and Europe in particular. And he created the challenge for scientists to find a way to produce nitrogen fertilizer from some uh, more abundant source. Two men rose to that. Uh, these two men, Bosch and Haber, who came up with a way to extract nitrogen from the atmosphere, where it makes up 78% of the air that we breathe, and turn it into a fertilizer that can be applied to the fields. That, because it's so much of the, of the atmosphere, it is a nearly uh, inexhaustible resource. And both of these men won the Nobel Prize for their work. Their process, the Haber-Bosch process, now doubles the amount of food we can grow on the planet. It's responsible for feeding three to four billion more people and uses only 1% of the energy that humanity uses overall. So ideas can find substitutes for scarce resources when properly motivated. Finally, ideas can transform waste into value. This is a landfill mining operation uh, in Germany. And what's happening here is that what we've thrown out as garbage has tremendous value in it. The government of Japan estimates that Japan's landfills alone can take a 10-year supply of gold for the world and about a 10-year supply of rare earth minerals for uh, the Japanese economy. Alcoa estimates that the world's landfills overall could replace aluminum mines for a period of 15 to 20 years just by taking the aluminum out of landfills, even when aluminum is a highly recycled uh, metal. So there's tremendous uh, resources that we've taken for granted. The world is a finite place, right? But what that means for minerals, for materials, is that they're not lost, they're not destroyed. We use something, we throw it out, we haven't destroyed it, we've just changed its location, we've changed its concentration. In many, time, in many cases, we're increasing its entropy, we're spreading it more widely, but in many other cases, we're actually concentrating it. The yields of rare earth metals in landfills are actually higher than they are in most mines around the world. So as technology is improving, we're learning to make that cycle more closed and to turn all waste into recycling, effectively. So ideas can reduce resource use, they can find substitutes for various resources, and they can transform waste into value. So what does that mean for the limits of growth? What are they really? Is there a population limit? Yes, there is only a finite number of people that this planet could support. But it doesn't look like we're going to hit that. 
if we look at the population of the world going forward, well, from the past, heading into the future, what we see is that if fertility trends continue, the world will top out at between 9 and 10 billion people around 2050, 2060, and then actually start to decline. Now, this depends upon those trends in fertility continuing, but right now, but the most important driver of that is continuing to increase wealth, education, and freedom for people around the world, and especially for women around the world. If that continues to happen on pace, then we will halt population growth of the planet, and in fact, we'll start to face a different problem, which is not enough young people uh, on the planet. That's another topic for another day. What about the physical resources? Given that we might have 9 or 10 billion people, what is the limit of physical resource growth on the planet? Well, it's real, um, but let me put it in perspective. <clears throat> this drop of oil on the screen represents all of the energy that human civilization uses in a given year today. It's a very, very, very large drop of oil. But if we compare it to a different source of energy, which is the amount of energy that the sun strikes the planet with each year, we find that the latter is drastically higher than the former. And in fact, the sun every year hits the Earth at the top of the atmosphere with 10,000 times as much energy as humanity uses from all sources combined. Okay? 10 seconds of sunlight, about as long as it takes me to say this second, is the same amount of energy as humanity uses from all sources in one day. One hour of sunlight striking the top of the atmosphere provides the Earth with as much energy as humanity uses from all sources combined in an entire year. Now that insulation, that solar energy, gets manifested in many ways. It heats up parts of the atmosphere, and that creates wind, and wind power now is, is growing. It's about 1% of US electricity, but uh, nearly doubling every two years. It heats up moisture that goes up into the atmosphere, comes down as rainfall, which produces hydropower, which is about 10% of the electricity that we use in the United States. But most powerfully in the long term, the sun's rays striking the ground are tremendous in their energy. So tremendous that if you wanted to power the world entirely off of direct solar and look out at our energy needs for 2030, what you would need in land area are those little green boxes. So less than a third of a percent of the world's land area at current solar cell efficiencies is all to capture enough energy to meet all of the world's energy needs through 2030. That's stupendous, right? The problem is not the available energy, it's not the available land, it's the cost of manufacturing those solar cells. Solar cells are manufactured on silicon wafers, a lot like we make computer chips. And like computer chips, they're very, very expensive. Now, that is changing over time. It's changing in part because we're raising the efficiency of cells, so what fraction light the hits them, gets turned into electricity. So it's going up and to the right, various different technologies. But more importantly, we are lowering the cost of manufacturing. Okay? There is something like a Moore's Law. There's an exponential decline in the cost of solar per watt. In 19, it costs about $20 per watt of solar, and today it costs about $1 per watt of solar. That if we go back further to the invention of solar cells in 1964, it cost about $40 per watt of solar then, and again today it's about $1 per watt. What that means is that we're hitting the crossover point right around now. It's different in different parts of the world, but in Southern California, for large cancellations, we've just about hit the point where solar electricity is as cheap as electricity coming from a coal or natural gas plant. And then over the next 10 to 15 years, that will become increasingly true in different parts of the world that have less sunlight than Southern California. Now, capturing energy is one thing. You also have to be able to use that energy for things like nighttime use, when the sun isn't shining, or things like automobiles that need to have the energy on board. And so for that, we need storage. And in a lot of ways right now, storage is actually a harder problem than capturing energy from the sun. But there is some hope for this, because what we can see is that there are trends in increasing the density of storage, how much energy you can store in a given size or weight, and reducing the price. Lithium ion batteries are what you have in your iPads, your laptops, your phones, and the tremendous competition for devices that last longer and are lighter has driven huge innovation in those. So over the course of about 15 years, 
1990 to 2005, the price of lithium-ion batteries per kilowatt hour they store dropped by a factor of 10. And the density, how much energy you could store in a given weight, went up by about a factor of two and a half. And in fact, that's not a new trend. Since the early 1900s, the amount of energy you can store in a weight of battery has been going up and up and up by about a factor of five. And on the horizon now are new types of batteries. These last two bars are metal air batteries, zinc air and lithium air. And those look to have densities, uh, theoretical densities, that are 10 times higher than the best lithium ion batteries we have today. They're not commercialized, they're in phase. But if they fulfill their promise, we will get to a point where you can have an electric car that can go hundreds of miles on a charge, and you can get to the point where we can deploy batteries at grid scale to be able to capture solar and wind for use overnight. Now, there's another approach as well. Batteries are one way to store energy, but another is fuel. Fuel is not just an energy source, where oil is a source to a certain extent, but it's also a way to, to carry energy with you. And gasoline has an energy density that's times as high per unit weight as a lithium ion battery today. So it's extremely convenient for things like cars and airplanes and so on. So anybody know who this man is? Craig Venter. Very good. Somebody whispered it back there. So why is Craig Venter talking about fuels? Um, because Exxon paid his company, Synthetic Genomics, $600 million to work on next generation biofuels that turn sunlight, CO2, and water into fuel. George Church is another pioneer in genome sequencing. Uh, he's an advisor at Singularity University, and he's involved with the company working on this as well. And what both of these are leveraging is something that I've heard already uh, in your, your time here, which is that genomics is moving incredibly fast. If Moore's Law is that black line, the trend in the price sequencing and gene printing is the red line. It is quantitatively the fastest rate of innovation of any technology on the planet right now. So what both of these pioneers in genomics are trying to do is engineer microorganisms like algae to directly produce fuel. So you take uh, an entity that can absorb sunlight, water, CO2. Today, if we use algae biofuels, people harvest them. They drag big nets through this. They have to process the algae, heat them up, burst them, turn their, their products, their internal sugars and fats, into fuel. Instead, what both Venter and Church are trying to do, competing with each other, is genetically engineer them so that they actually excrete, as waste products, biofuel either of the biodiesel sort of variety, meaning a lipid, a fat, or an ethanol sort of variety, meaning a, a sugar. And this has tremendous advantages. So one thing is it can operate on salt water, it can operate on brackish water that humans can't drink, so it can on in deserts that are very sunny and abut large bodies of salt water very easily. And if the promise of them is fulfilled, if the that uh, look possible in experiments are achieved, then we're talking about the ability to produce nearly an infinite amount of fuel at a cost that is lower than gasoline is sold today. In fact, DARPA uh, has been talking about $5 a gallon uh, biokerosene in 2014. Now, this might sound crazy because the current price for biofuel that the Navy pays is about $23 a gallon, but in 2008, the U.S. Navy was paying about $100 a gallon for biofuels. So they know that investing in this can drop the price of technology. Why does DARPA care? Because the cost of fuel in forward war zones is actually something like $200 a gallon when you factor in the convoys to get fuel in there, the security you have to provide, and so on. And DARPA is also concerned that in any future war, the U.S. Uh, might be cut off from foreign energy supplies. So DARPA wants to see a situation where the US can be energy self-sufficient and even where individual battle groups or individual forward bases can be generating some significant portion of their own fuel. There are also ways to do this without biology, to use a kind of dry process to pull CO2 out of the air and turn it into fuel. I won't go into them too far. And the nice thing about biofuels is, while burning them gives off CO2, all the carbon you're sticking into the air when you burn them is carbon that was sucked out of the atmosphere to create them in the first place. So it's sort of a closed loop, or nearly a closed loop. Okay. So there is potential here on the energy front. And if we can crack energy, we can crack everything. We live on a water planet. 
We worry about our freshwater sources, but the fresh water that we access is less than a tenth of a percent of all of the water on the planet. 97% of the water on the planet is in the oceans and it's salty. It used to be that to des desalinate that, to turn it into fresh water, you had to boil that water, capture the steam, and condense it. And that's a very, very energy intensive process. But we've learned, we've learned to mimic the behavior of membranes around cells that are selectively permeable. They can let some things through and not others. Mimicking that, we have taken the energy it takes to desalinate and dropped it by a factor of 10 over the last 40 years. So where it once took 16 kilowatt hours per cubic meter of, of water to desalinate it, now it takes around two. And if we look at that efficiency, with about one-tenth of the world's energy budget, we could desalinate enough water to meet everyone's water needs from just desalination, even before we increase energy availability and continue to innovate in desalination. Food, we have to increase food availability by 70% by 2050. That's a huge challenge, and we want to do it without chop chopping down more uh, tropical jungle. Okay? Now, we could do it if we could just lift the world's yields to the same yield as the U.S. and Europe enjoy. If you look at the, uh, the red line, the bottom is world yield, and the blue line at the top is U.S. yield. So that in the United States and Europe, the food produced per acre is about double that of the world as a whole. And it's really because of greater investment in uh, more ability to afford fertilizer, more ability to afford tractors, and so on. And there are way other ways as well. One thing that we know is that corn, for instance, produces about twice the yield per acre as wheat. And we know the genetics for that are something that we can port as well. I'm going to hurry up here because we're running a little bit late. So physical limits exist, but they are extremely, extremely distant. The wealth limit is even more distant. And I want to be very clear on this point. The limits to growth model says that to get more wealth, you have to consume more resources. But if we look at what's happened around the world, GDP per person has roughly doubled since 1970, while consumption has stayed almost flat. So the top line here is GDP per capita around the world in green, and the red lines are CO2 emissions per capita and energy use per capita. They have risen, but they've risen nothing like the amount of wealth. How is that possible? Well, consider an iPhone versus ENIAC, the first digital computer. The iPhone has billions of times more computational capability, but it's also tremendously smaller and uses about a billion times less energy per calculation and costs hundreds of dollars instead of tens of millions of dollars. Ultimately, ideas are the ultimate resource. They are the thing that makes an iPhone much more powerful than an ENIAC. It's that concentrated knowledge while still using less. And ideas tend to spread, accumulate, and multiply. So there is no practical limit. The problem is not solved, though. We are in a race between consumption and innovation. This is a very Darwinian marketplace, and the companies that are working on this, many of them will fail. Ultimately, that's to the benefit of the consumer, because the few that survive will be those with the best technology. The big problems are twofold. Scale. So to take the world and deploy solar on all of those dots, which are very small compared to the overall land that we have, it will take 10 million of these. This is the Nellis Air Force Base solar installation. And that will take roughly on current path about $50 trillion till the year 2050, and that will allow for about three degrees Celsius of warming, which is not something we want. The even bigger failure, even bigger problem is market failure. This is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, and it looks very nice, but in the late 1960s, it looked like this. You could stick your hand in it and pull it out covered with oil. And the reason is there was a market fit. All the businesses that surrounded that river had every incentive to save costs by dumping their used oil, their crap, into the river. It was a cost for society as a whole, but it wasn't felt by that economic entity, the business, the factory. It's a market externality. Okay? What that meant was eventually catastrophe. All the fish died in the river, and then in 1969, a rail car going over the river threw a spark, a flick of oil on the river, and it caught on fire. The river itself burst into flame. Uh, that was a wake-up call 
for the world. And it led to a lot of positive things uh, in the US. If we look more broadly, every environmental problem on the planet today is the case of an externality. It's a market failure where the environmental damage that's being caused is a cost to someone other than the person doing the damage. So one entity can absorb the benefits while pushing the costs to someone else. That's true of deforestation, freshwater depletion, air pollution, fish in the sea, and of climate change. These are all problems of the commons. So how do we solve that? Well, this is the Cuyahoga River today, and it's a problem we have solved. Um, the ozone layer depletion was a major problem in the 1980s. Here's what it looked like then. Red is bad, let's say. And now it's turned around, um, and we have reduced the release of CFCs that destroy ozone to nearly zero. Um, and the ozone layer is actually healing. Acid rain was a major problem in the 1980s and 1990s, also one that we've essentially solved. We've cut the of acid rain producing sulfur dioxide by about half through something called cap and trade. This, interestingly enough, is not an effort led solely by the left. It's been an effort that has had input from both the left and the right in some times. The EPA in the US was created by Richard Nixon. The uh, Montreal Protocol that limited the release of CFCs to destroy the ozone layer was signed by Ronald Reagan. And cap and trade for sulfur dioxide that causes acid rain was signed by George Bush. So it is possible to work across the aisle for this. In every case, by the way, the actual cost of fixing these problems has been between half and a quarter of the projected costs because innovation is... The biggest problem we have today, the biggest externality, is carbon dioxide release and other greenhouse gases that cause climate change. And so the way to solve that is to put a price on these. Economic actors that are producing that damage um, will feel the pain themselves. I'm right at the end, so I'm going to give you the last concept, which is that the way to handle this is to tax the bad, not the good. People think about any new tax as causing a major economic disruption, but there are ways to handle this. And the idea here is a revenue-neutral carbon tax. So if the government raises revenue right now via one mechanism, say income tax, the idea is to shift that to a carbon tax where you shrink one tax and the other. So the total amount of money being taken out of the economy is the same, but it changes the prices of things. So coal becomes relatively more expensive relative to solar, say, and people shift in that way. So I will end here just saying that there is no conflict between green and growth. And what you can all do is communicate about these issues, participate in the political process, and most relevant to this audience is innovate. You are here getting educated on these topics, and you're here at a very entrepreneurial environment where you can help launch the companies and technologies that will solve some of these problems. And keep hope, because we fixed it before. All right, thank you.